I think we can start with our first panel of the day. Um, welcome back. I hope you all had a quick rest, short and uh, good rest uh, during the break. Um, the first panel of today is called EU Borders and Digitalization, AI Migration and Fundamental Rights. And I'm happy to welcome on the digital and the physical sp uh, stage here in the room, Alexandra Giese. So, sorry, my... Um, She's a digital expert for the Greens EFA parliamentary group in the European Parliament. She has been a member of the European Parliament since 2019 and serves as the group's vice president since 2022. She serves on the Consumer Protection Committee where she works on AI digital policies and platform re regulation. She holds a master's in social science with a focus on migration studies from the University of Venice and has a master's in conference interpreting from the University of Applied Science in Cologne. Um, Alexandra is joining us from Brussels today, I believe. Welcome, Alexandra. Thank you very much. Our second guest joining us from Italy is Caterina Rodelli. Um, Caterina is an EU policy analyst at Access Now. Access Now, for those who don't know the organization, is a global organization that fights for human rights in the digital age. They're uh, Caterina is based in Brussels and works on issues related to biometric surveillance, artificial intelligence and privacy, so lots of the topics that we've already touched upon today. But her main focus is around the intersection between technology, borders and the rights of people on the move. She has a profound background in working with migrants' rights organizations and holds an Erasmus Mundus master's degree in cooperation studies in the Mediterranean region. Welcome, Katarina. Thank you. And with us in the room, Lena Rohrbach, also a warm welcome to you. Lena is the policy advisor for human rights in the digital age and for arms export control at Amnesty International Germany, based in Berlin. Prior to that, she worked as a campaigner and a journalist. Lena was also the spokesperson for the Pirate Party in Germany, and she served on the board of Humanistische Union. Lena studied philosophy, cultural studies and history in Berlin, and she holds a master's in international human rights law at the University of Nottingham. Welcome. And, and also to introduce myself, my name is Monika Remy. Um, it's my pleasure to be moderating this event today for you or the two panels. The last two times I moderated um, an event with Gunnar Werner Institute and the Queen Network, um, we looked at international law and how legal instruments can be used as tools for migrants and refugees to claim their rights. Unfortunately, today, our, um, especially the focus of the first panel will be quite the opposite, actually. We're going to look at EU legislation that deprives migrants of their rights. We've touched upon that a little bit already. It's the, the, the peril systems, the peril legal system that we've talked about. Um, so we're going to unpack these legal mechanisms and examine the, the link between legal, political and tax systems and trace their colonial legacies. We'll have a very nice succession of first the keynote where we looked at like the larger questions in a more of a theoretical framework. Um, now we'll give the legal context um, in this first panel and then we come back to the historical legacies, ethical challenges, the, the more of the theoretical larger questions again in the second panel. I can already tell you it's going to be EU heavy, it's, it will get techy, it will get dark and um, politically dark um, in, uh, your, over the course of the debate, but I will try to make sure that we won't lose any of you during, the, during, um, during our panel discussions. And I promise that we will also look for the beacons of hope and, um, and have some cyber utopian visions at the end of this conference. So um, to lay the ground for the debate and for our first panel, I'd like to ask Alexandra again, why do we have to talk about digitalization of the EU borders at the moment? What is happening at Europe's borders? If you could bring well, thank us you back very in. much. Thank you yeah. for the introduction. I have a very strong echo. I don't. Yeah, now it's better. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so thank you again. Thank you very much for for the kind introductory words and uh, good morning or hello to everybody. 
Um, why do we have to talk about digitalization of the EU borders now? I think from a political point of view, migration and security is one of the main topics in Europe right now that is pushed very, very strongly by the far right. And this has been so for the past 10 years, but very successfully, definitely since 2015, pushing also conservatives and liberals and part of the social democrats to a much more stricter um, and less human rights based vision of migration, especially as in, in terms of, of refugees. So I think there was, there was a really strong political point there to put a focus on there. So what has been going on? We have seen a growing trend of increased digitalization of border surveillance since 9-11, so for a long time. At that time, it led to ramping up the powers of Europol, for example, in Europe, and the first introduction of mass surveillance of air travelers via passenger name records. And then in 2018, the travel authorization system for visa waiver countries was introduced, ATS, which was the first one to really explicitly introduce an algorithmic risk assessment and profiling of travelers. But today, digitalization is much more advanced and the situation at Europe's borders is much worse. In the past 10 years, um, the IOM has counted more than 50,000 people who have lost their lives during migratory movements. And of that number, over 25,000 died in the Mediterranean. Uh, so we should be using uh, we should be using digital technologies to save people from drowning, but that unfortunately is not what we're doing. We have seen that tens of thousands of asylum seekers have been brutally attacked and pushed back at Europe's borders in the past year, sometimes by EU countries like Greece and Italy. Sometimes by EU neighboring countries like Tunisia and Liberty and Libya, and often with the help of technology that received funding from the European Union. And we don't expect the situation to get any better with the new asylum and migration pact. Um, today, AI and ADM tools are mainly used in two areas of the borders. The first one <clears throat> is border surveillance. Um, this primarily means unmanned vehicles. One example of this is, for example, the, the road border project. It is developing surveillance robots that patrol in the air and in the sea and everywhere in between. And the second um, main area is the management and predictions of the movement of people. That means mostly automatic systems that are being developed to predict migration flows. For example, automated fingerprinting is already being used at EU level with the help of large databases, biometric identification such as iris scans or 3D face mapping is also becoming increasingly sophisticated. A big EU super database is being established to interconnect all existing databases. And then there are also EU-funded projects um, which are researching algorithmic recognition, uh, recognition of emotions such as lie detectors, which in most AI circles are just simply considered as snake oil, so as not working. And I think what is particularly um, worrying is the, that, first of all, the fact that migration is only framed in terms of a threat to security that needs to be controlled and this kind of political framing puts really the emphasis on threat and on the need to surveillance and therefore legitimate way of surveillance that wouldn't be legitimate in any other context. And that is something that we know from a lot of AI research that questionable surveillance and AI technologies are first used on people who can't really defend themselves especially poor people, for example, in the U.S., but we have seen that also in the, in the Netherlands, and in our case, especially refugees and migrants who don't have the possibility to really strongly defend themselves. And this makes it particularly worrying because this is not only um, a real threat to, to the human rights of the migrants' concerns, but it's also laying a potential base for that, rolling it out to the larger population. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Alexandra. That was uh, already a lot. I'm, I can assure you we'll hear some of the terms again and again. And at the end of the um, event, you will know what biometric scans are and and have more of an understanding what the automated decision making um, and prediction mechanisms are. So, but thank you, Alexandra, for also bringing in the 9-11, um, the, the kind of like the framework of 9-11 um, to remind us that that really was a turning point in terms of border surveillance 
questions and um, also for mentioning, first mentioning the, these, these techniques and um, also how they're used for privileged travelers as well and um, might be used for all of us. Um, we've already heard, and in this panel we want to lay our focus on, the two acts and the act and the pact, the two um, EU instruments that have been recently agreed on and passed um, that, um, that govern digitalization and migration in the EU. And we will f first zoom in on the AI Act now. Lena, for this, I'd like to hear from you. Um, Amnesty International, I think, dubbed the EU AI Act on the one hand as a milestone for human rights in the digital age, but also called it disappointing that the EU prioritizes the interests of industry and law enforcement over protecting people and their human rights. Um, if you could explain a bit more about what the EU AI Act is, because I think for uh, most of us, EU law and legislation is often a bit difficult to understand. And then also, what for you are its most problematic elements when it comes to migration and border control? Yeah, thank you. So your yeah, milestone, uh, let's say half a mile or a few, a few meters stone. <laughs> um, in, uh, to spoil, to put a little spoiler at the start, um, it's a missed opportunity when it came to the urgent need for a regulation that protects people on the move. And um, the, the AI Act is an act, so it's binding for all European states, not only a regulation, and it follows a risk-based approach. Many of you might have heard of that risk-based approach. So it tries to categorize AI types and its use cases into so risky that it should be banned, so risky that it, it should be regulated, um, medium risk, only a few transparency and other obligations, almost no risks, it, it tries to follow this risk-based approach. And when you think about it, you should think that's a good starting point um, for talking about the rights of refugees, because they are um, obviously exposed to very high risks on their journey to Europe. It should not need to be like that, but Fortress Europe made it that way, that they are in a very risky situation. And they, and they interact with migration authorities, which are authorities that by nature have the authority to deeply interfere with fundamental rights. So from a risk-based approach, you should think that refugees get a lot of protection in the AI Act. And unfortunately, exactly the opposite has happened. So what the AI Act does, it is um, sets up a separate framework for refugees and for migration authorities and also law enforcement authorities, I should say. Um, and you can see that, for example, AI, which is rightly so prohibited in other areas, is allowed uh, by, for use by migration authorities. So one example for that would be so-called um, emotion recognition AI, Alexandra already said that's kind of a snake oil, it, it doesn't work, it's very discriminating in effect, but it has already been tested in Europe with a project iBorder Control, for example, which was a virtual a project for a virtual border guard um, supposed to see whether a refugee is lying, not working, just discriminating against people. Or facial recognition technologies, um, which, which can be used by migration authorities and law enforcement authorities. And some people at first think this is a neutral technology, but by now we know it's not. Um, it was already noted in the keynote that Amnesty International has done quite some research on the use of facial recognition technology in contexts such as Hyderabad in India, in New York City, or Hebron and East Jerusalem and other places where it just clearly shows that facial recognition technology is mainly used against, overproportionately used against racialized people. And it's also, most of you will know that by now, it's very prone to error when used against, to surveil racialized people, but also women, children, disabled, LGBTIQ, non-binary, so pretty much everyone who's not um, a white adult male. Um, there are also exemptions to the transparency obligations. So the AI Act introduces an EU registry, a database, where authorities um, should register their high-risk AI 
use case that this is good for affected persons who can say, do I interact with an AI when I interact with this authority? It's great for civil society organizations such as Amnesty or Access Now because we can see, oh, there's an authority that uses a high-risk AI. Maybe we should do some research on it, whether there are fundamental rights, human rights violations involved. But migration authorities get an exemption, so they do not have to register, transparently register the AI they use. So all of these are examples for that separate framework and actually less protection. And then in the end, there's also a blanket exemption in the AI Act for AI that is used for the purpose of national security, which is a vaguely not legally defined term, which is often used in the context of migration. And in these cases, the, apply, the AI Act does not apply at all, which we think um, is really like a blanket excuse that can be used for viral human rights violations. So um, what is to be expected from that separate framework in the future? Um, I, I'm afraid nothing good, because what AI uh, does, it is often acts as an amplifier or a magnifying glass, which magnifies already existing problems. And that means that it's on the one hand, due to the fact that existing injustices, in particular discrimination, are learned by the AI and then reproduced via its training data. This is a problem that is um, fortunately well known by now. And on the other hand, AI is often um, used with the aim of making processes more efficient and faster and to scale them up. And that's regardless of whether this process leads to human rights violation or maybe already constitutes in itself a human rights violation. And in these cases, AI just makes human rights violations more efficient. Mm. So I think it was said earlier already, when we talk about emerging technologies, it's always very important to also talk about the broader political and societal context in which they are used. It's not, never an isolated question of technology. And the EU migration policies are characterized by illegal pushbacks and by violence against migrants and an erosion of the right to asylum. And so it's very likely that if we just put more emerging technologies and more AI on that, it will just lead to even more human rights violations. Yeah, uh, thank you, Lena. I was telling you before, and it was going to be a bit dark, but we'll get to more um, hopeful um, hopeful uh, topics as well. But this is uh, this is where we stand at the moment. And Katharina, I would like to ask you if you, you want to add on that. I'm not sure if you were able to listen to the, the keynote. Your campaign, the Protect Not Surveil campaign or coalition uh, was already, has already been mentioned this morning. Um, the Protect Not Survey Coalition started off in February 2023. It advocated, or its, its aim was to advocate for the EU AI Act to protect people on the move from the harms that can arise from the use of AI systems. Um, and with this perspective on surveillance, I would like to hear whether you want to add to Lena's analysis of the EU AI Act and its implications on people on the move. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, thank you. Yes, great. Uh, and Lena gave already a very good uh, overview on the AI Act, uh, highlighting all the problematic points of this legislation and highlighting how it's like shamelessly, it just produces a double standard when it comes to the legal protection that it offers. Um, so Lena uh, really quite clearly explained how these regulations use this risk-based approach. And I think it's it would be nice just to let sink a bit in what this risk-based approach mean because I think we have kind of normalized the idea that you could you know divide systems based on risk but throughout the negotiation I had the feeling that we did not consider how much this reflected in like who can be considered more at risk than the others and we saw it with the outcome of the legislation there is this notion of risk that is kind of like uh, compared to the notion of fundamental rights. Whereas we have fundamental rights that apply to everyone, the reality is that risks do not apply to everyone in the same way. There are people that are perceived to to be able to hold more risks, to be um, able to be put more at risk than the others. And we see this with the um, with how, how the legislation uh, protects 
migrant people and racialized people. There are groups of people in our society that are dehumanized to an ex extent that it's considered that when they are at risk, this is not as problematic as if other people, other groups are at risk. And Lena already explained this. For example, we have the prohibition on emotional recognition that applies to, you know, um, European citizens, but do not apply uh, to migrant people because there, it's, there is this notion, this normalization that they can bear a higher level of risk. So I think that this reflection of how the European Union is normalizing, legalizing this notion is something we should uh, always bear in mind, also considering the new parliament. Uh, maybe just a, another couple of points uh, that I would like to add is that um, as Protect Not Surveil, which is a, a coalition of uh, digital migrants rights organization and uh, human rights organization, we were also calling for other things to be banned that did not make it in even in the parliament position. Uh, one is the um, use of profiling system and automated risk assessment, which is something that we are seeing already used, being used a lot during visa procedures. So we will see it also used into normal uh, Schengen visa um, application procedures where uh, candidates will be automated profile to see who is more likely to pose a risk to the public security or who is more likely to overstay the, their visa. Uh, we had made the claim that these kind of systems are de facto discriminatory and therefore should be prohibited, but this did not fly, European Parliament. And then another type of systems that we were trying to um, bring the attention on, but it was not included within the whole legislation is forecasting tool to predict migration uh, movements. This is something uh, very concerning uh, that is being widely tested within also the umbrella of European research projects that we have heard mentioned already a lot. The Road Border Project was mentioned, the I Border CTRL project was mentioned, and there are other projects that are also testing how you can use forecasting tools to predict migration flows. Um, and we were making a claim of how these systems also uh, are used to normalize certain ideas about movements, certain ideas about irregular movements, and what is considered to be a type of movement that deserves more right than the others. These type of systems, forecasting tools, did not make it within the whole text of the legislation. So that's another point that I think should flag. And then the last one, um, just to have an idea of how this legislation tried to exclude migrant people and racialized people from being protected from the very beginning, is that since the beginning of this law, there was an exemption for um, artificial intelligence systems used within migration databases. Uh, so if you are familiar with uh, the digital policy in migration, you would know that there are like databases such as Eurodac, which is a database which is used for storing uh, fingerprints, uh, information, and other type of information about asylum seekers. That are other um, databases, such as the one that I mentioned before, the Visa Information System, and many others that involve or will involve the use of AI systems that are regulated by the uh, AI Act, the biometric uh, data processing, automated um, decision making system, and, and other forms of uh, automation. These all of these systems were at the beginning, excluded by the AI Act. Uh, the Parliament made uh, a good job into trying to contest that. Uh, right now, what we have, however, is a grace period for this system. This system will be able to use to continue functioning and as they were planned. And they will be asked by 20, 20, 2030 to actually comply with the AI Act. But we see that if we give another six years period of time, to um, agencies to train the systems into the context of migration, it will be very hard in a six years time to reverse the, the course of things. Um, so I, I just wanted to add these other uh, extra points uh, on the AI Act. Thank you so much, Katarina. I think uh, a lot of the points that we mentioned or that we heard about in in the keynote are coming kind of are filled with life now um for example the opaqueness of technologies and how that kind of uh, instills fear in in people i think is something that um is is becoming very clear now also the fact how that or uh, the, the fact how 
um, people are being dehumanized by kind of transcribing a, a human into data and how that the data profiles. And um, I'm very much looking forward to our second panel where we can discuss how that uh, um, how that lives within a colonial legacy of dehumanizing, othering people and giving kind of um, making different legal systems for people, I think is a, something that we know very well from colonial context. Um, but coming back to this um, question of um, dehumanizing or making certain categories of, of migrants, the good migrants and the, the worthy and unworthy migrants, as Menja put it, or the, um, the different systems for migrants and non-migrants, whatever that status will be based on, if it comes back to blood, um, as we heard in the keynote, that would be, of course, the, the worst case scenario. Um, but Alexandra, um, I like it's it's for us. It's a real pleasure and uh, and uh, a great opportunity to have us uh, to have you with us today and be able to talk about the negotiations of the EU Act as you experience it as a member of the Parliament and and of the Committee on Consumer Rights. Um, so we'd like to hear from you. Why is it that migrants are exposed to certain risks and technologies that the rest of Europe will be safeguarded from? And why was it so hard in the negotiation process to give migrants the same protection as anyone else? Or well, impossible as it seems. Yeah, I think um, Katarina and Lena already did a great job and explaining that, what, what happened in the negotiations. I mean, the parliament managed to, in the beginning, to include some bans that then were dropped, that, that went a lot further than the final trilogue outcomes and also what we have now. So I think the discussion in the parliament was a lot better than in council, but the final outcome is, is absolutely not satisfying. Why is that is, is a more political question, so I'm not going to go back to the details that Lena and Katarina really explained. I mean, it's really what, what you said about the colonial legacy. I think that plays a role. There's just an, an unconscious racism that's strong with people. That, that I think that is so, and you will come back to that on the next panel, as I understand. And more politically, it's, it's really a very strong far-right agenda to see migration not as an opportunity or as a human rights issue, but basically as a threat to security. And it's a very powerful narrative for far-right politicians because everything that creates fear within the population also makes sure you have an enormous reach on social media. And that kind of enormous reach on social media has made the far right so successful in many European countries. And on Sunday, after with the elections, we have seen um, the outcome of this. And that is sort of contagious because conservatives obviously see their voters leave to go to the far right, see that that strategy is extremely successful. And it sort of resonates with many of them, this idea of creating security. And um, therefore, they take completely take over that frame that migration is just a security issue, a threat to security, and they, they completely take over that narrative. And once you have that narrative installed, that migration is something that's some kind of dark black monster pressing on the European frontiers, on the European borders, you have to completely dehumanize the people you're talking about. So we're not really speaking about, about it's as if we're not speaking about real people, but some kind of, you know, the, the, the kind of wording that is used, like, like floods of people coming in, water flows and so on. That is the already dehumanizing people. And if you combine that with that idea, that's a threat. That's an army taking over Europe, all the, the kind of speaking of uncontrolled migration, um, which the conservatives have completely taken over, um, uh, taken over from, from the far right or illegal migration. If it's not illegal, you know, if people ask for asylum, it's absolutely not illegal. It's completely regulated. It's completely legal, illegal. But we started at a certain point seeing also the conservative and the liberals just speaking about illegal migration, um, about these uncontrolled flows. And once you have that, you create, you, you further increase that feeling of un insecurity and migration as a threat in the population. So they receive this request from the population to control it. And this is what really dehumanizes people 
And then applying opaque technologies is seen as just, you know, a means of controlling that terrible, terrible threat as if it was in military terms almost. And that makes it so difficult um, on, on a more a narrative kind of level to say, no, these are people and these are people who have human rights and fundamental rights exactly like we do. Um, and I think this is why, why all these exceptions got through, uh, through the AI Act and they weren't even talked about that much, frankly, you know, in the public opinion and was all, well, the AI Act is, is controlling AI technologies and it's, it's setting limits to the technology and it's safeguarding us from surveillance. But for the migrants, it's, it's not true at all. And it's, it's extremely problematic. And I'm afraid it's going to get worse because it got a far right and right conservative majority elected at these elections. So we really need to watch out for that in the next mandate. Yeah, thank you, Alexandra. I think that's a very interesting point as well from a feminist perspective, the kind of militarization of the discourse in gen that we see in general. And then I think the EU AI Act and migration is um, one field where it plays out very drastically. Um, thank you all for kind of introducing the EU AI Act and its flaws when it comes to people on the move to us. Um, I'd like to now move on to the second um, larger piece of legislation that we want to discuss in our panel that's the pact on migration that has also been agreed on now in may uh, just before the elections um it's a set of new rules that's supposed to manage migration and it established a common asylum system at eu level or is establishing the system um it has been widely criticized and i think um also in the german media was very um present for its attack on migrant rights in general the, the detention facilities that we will now have or that we will have more of the so-called safe third countries relocation deals with partner countries etc cetera, etc cetera. but i personally feel that the surveillance and the tech aspects of this pact have are less widely discussed or less known here in germany um, so I'd like to to uh, dig into that with you. Um, maybe Alexandra to ask you again, where, where are the main linkages between the EU AI Act and the Pact on Migration? Well, thank you. Well, the NGO Privacy International has uh, published a very good letter from the Protect Non-Survey Coalition, which has a good summary of the main interlinkages and issues for fundamental rights. I think the first big problem is that the Migration Pact expands a wide system of data collection and automatic exchange, which is leading to a regime of mass surveillance of migrants under the Eurodac regulation. The pact will also ent enable intrusive technolo technological practices in various stages of asylum processing, for example, the extraction of mobile phone data in the asylum procedures regulation. And that means, in short, that huge amounts of data will be collected from people on the move. And with the exceptions in the AI Act, it will be possible to use those data as training data for AI systems used in vulnerab vulnerability checks, forecasting tools, lie detectors, dialect recognition systems, and other invasive border surveillance technologies. Yeah, thank you. So thank you also for introducing the term intrusive technologies. Katarina, maybe you can expand a bit on that so what, and the role of surveillance within the Pact on Migration. Yes, thank you. So I uh, also thank you, Alexandra, for mentioning the letter that um, we wrote in the aftermath of the vote. So I don't know how much like the audience is um, familiar with the Migration Pact, uh, the new Pact on Migration and Asylum. Uh, when we say a pact, it's a pact because it's a, a set of different reforms. Uh, it's uh, the recast of already existing laws that make the uh, common European and asylum system, but it's also the uh, proposal of new laws that add new uh, measures when it comes to migration and asylum policy. So it's I think it's uh, uh, it's a group of five, six, it depends sometimes how many um, laws you want to put in, but it's around uh, six different laws uh, that drastically have changed, um, will change the way that the European Union looks at and, and makes policies on migration, it's actually the normalization of what has been going on in the last five years. And how does it change uh, from what is the digital surveillance element? 
So Alexandra already mentioned some of them, but this new package is so much focused on the notion on, on two Ds, uh, detention and deportation. It's not about safety. It's not about safeguards. It's not about protection. It's about uh, legalizing more and more this colonial approach uh, toward migration, towards the separation of who's the good migrant and the and the uh, bad migrant. Also the normalization that the good migrant is someone that needs to be assisted rather than empowered. How do we see this from a digital perspective? First of all, uh, the... First of all, what I was saying before about the forecasting of migration movements, this will be something that will be um, will be allowed and also encouraged through the uh, migration pact, because in several parts of these laws, there is the encouragement of the processing of statistics uh, on uh, arrivals, statistics that will be used to um, forecast movements and therefore deploy Frontex and border agency to prevent the arrival of regular entries based on this forecast. Uh, so that's something that we cannot maybe see, perceive from a physical perspective, but that will be happening. The um, effects of uh, processing uh, and exchange of data. The second thing we can see is that, that the borders will become instrumental. People won't have de facto the right to apply for asylum in the, like as they enter the European Union, but they will first have to go through a screening procedure screening procedure that will have the um, that has the objective to see if a person actually has the right to apply for asylum or not. And this screening will actually come with some digital surveillance components. For example, people's uh, data will be run again, checked against already existing data to see if they are already flagged in existing databases as, as someone who has applied for asylum uh, in the European Union already, if was someone had applied for a visa and was um, refused. Um, there is also a component that is not really clear about profiling. So that's not really clear in the law, but there is also the possibility that people will be profiled if they could be considered a security risk or not. Um, biometric data will be taken by anyone who enters. Uh, Children also that should be protected, their biometric data is already like a sensitive data for everyone, but especially for children that do not really have the agency over their biometric data. Their fingerprints and facial images will be collected and stored for a period that arrives to 10 years. So that means that if you arrive that you are nine years old, your data will be collected until you're also um, over 18. Uh, people will already see this being tested in Greece uh, in the control uh, closed access centers that have huge surveillance technology component with thermal cameras, drones that sends, that are supposed to uh, check if anything is going on in the camps. Um, and then um, and then data will be exchanged um, in between police forces uh, and asylum agencies. And this is just some of the elements of things that will happen because of the pact. So we see that there is a big uh, link between the AI Act and the pact because some of the things that are regulated in the AI Act or are even prohibited are actually being encouraged by the pact. So you see how these two things are linked. But also we see how they are linked in the way that negotiations uh, were, were held. So we see how this colonial approach in human policy making is allowing for this. And I'm actually really looking forward to the conversation of this afternoon. It's not only also, I think we should also say it's not only a problem of the far right that is mainstreaming this, this narrative, but it's also the, the center left or the left per se. Some uh, parties that and groups that supposedly are from the left agreed for the uh, legislations that um, proposed the third safe country uh, concept. Uh, for example, in Libya, uh, which is not deemed as a third country, but the Libyan so-called Coast Guard has been widely equipped uh, by center-left parties in Italy to uh, keep people from departing. Um, is also the responsibility of the politics of not dealing with our European colonial past uh, when it wants to enforce human rights legislations is the fact of how we allow for double standards. Uh, and I'm also refer referring to things that are happening at Europe borders, um, like how 
the human rights standards are not upheld when it comes to the production of mobile phones in the Congo and how this leads to massive killings of people. Is this also linked to the war of annihilation on the Gaza Strip and the Palestinian people? And it's all linked to the fact of how European policies uh, process and deal with human rights in a very selective way. And this is the problem with the colonial past of the European Union. If you start selecting what are the human rights that you want to protect, this will backfire on you, that you want it or not. And this is what we see with the European policymaking in the context of migration. The fact that we don't want to actually face the colonial past and heal collectively of the things that were committed by also our ancestors, this will, is also being reproduced in the policies that we are putting out at the European Union level. Thank you, Katarina. That was um, a very strong statement. And uh, I think, Lena, something that you at Amnesty work on as well is the externalization of EU borders, and it has different aspects. But one is uh, technology, and I'd like to, to hear from you. What, what role does technology play in the process of externalizing EU borders? Yeah, very happy to explain something on that. And first, I would um, like to add a tiny um, other th point on what Katarina said, because she mentioned that in the pact, there's also a change included for the Eurodac regulation so that children as young as six are supposed to give their biometric data. It used to be 14, now it's children as young as six. And um, there's the language that um, there's also the possibility to use coercion if child-friendly methods fail. And as a mother who tries to like have their kids wash their hands a few days, uh, a few times a day, and um, then maybe sometimes child-friendly methods fail, and then okay, they wash their hands a little later. But that's not what will happen at these border procedures. And we've done um, research on what happened in, a so in the so-called hotspots in Italy at a time when many refugees arrived uh, on the shores of Italy and the European Commission uh, put more pressure on Italian authorities to make sure that there's a 100% biometric registration rate for the refugees because it was not 100% at the time. Um, and that actually led to physical violence, like people who were traumatized and for, for privacy or other reasons um, were not prepared to give up their biometric data at that point, were forced, were sometimes electroshocked. We have interviews with people who said that they, um, after they um, had been hit, lost their consciousness and when they woke up, their fingerprints had been taken. And that's not the rule, but it's something that happens without accountability and without a right to, proper right to redress and might, might happen to kids now. So there's a linkage between, um, a bit between laws on technologies and on biometric data and physical violence because you have to pose the follow-up question, what happens if the person is not prepared to give up their biometric data? Mm -hmm. And then we enter the, the realm of physical violence and now we have to talk about that for six-year-old kids. So, but I would not want to talk about another uh, very happy topic, which is um, the externalization of the European border regime. And there's indeed an increasing number of migration agreements with countries outside the European Union, which include Tunisia, Morocco, Egypt, Libya, Turkey, Niger, and others. And such agreements, for example, involve the outsourcing of whole asylum procedures or repatriation measures or um, cooperation measures against um, so-called human trafficking and others. Mm, and such corporations are also explicitly encouraged in the Pact on Migration. So the Pact on Migration is mainly on measures that are um, conducted within the European Union and Europe's borders, but it also encourages um, the externalization and cooperation with third countries. And that comes with a couple of problems. And one of it, um, more of a meta point, is that responsibilities of, of caring for people on the move remain in global south countries, which are already um, home to, to most of the world's migrants, while the European Union builds its fortress wars higher and higher. And it also comes with human rights violations and a circumvention of legal checks and safeguards increasingly because... So um, it used to be usually that um, uh, a legal agreement, uh, Article 218 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, 
regulates agreements between the European Union and third party states, for example, on migration. But agreements with third countries have recently been reached um, by circumventing these regulations. For example, the European Union-Turkey deal, which was labeled as, I think, a joint action plan or something like this. And the Tunisia agreement, EU-Tunisia agreement last year, which was labeled a memorandum of understanding by the European Commission. Um, and both have no clear legal character. And that makes for even less legal checks and safeguards and also parliamentary control by the European Parliament. And the human rights violations against refugees in Turkey and Tunisia, um, there's less redress if it doesn't have a clear legal character. So now, now this is on the, in the, did this happen anyway? And it's in addition encouraged by the new pact on migration. And now on top of that comes the AI Act. And the AI Act does not have an expert di export dimension, expert dimension, <laughs> maybe, but it does not have an export dimension. And what I mean by that is that even technologies that are considered to be so risky that they are banned within the European Union, which include social scoring, social scraping, or AI um, that uses particular vulnerabilities, um, that these can still be produced and exported in third countries, because we don't care what happens there, apparently. Um, and there's also another framework, which is the dual use regulation, but this is also not up to date when it comes to AI at all. So even technologies that are banned here by the AI Act, which are not many, we would have liked to have more technologies banned, but even the few that are banned can still be exported and then used in these third countries where we will have migration agreements increasingly without a legal character and outsource our asylum procedures where these technologies can then be used. So if you put all of this together, it makes for a pretty risky picture. Yeah, thank you, Lina. Um, that's, um, yeah, that's also something that we, I think, as civil society need to, to monitor very well what happens um, at Europe's borders that are expanded in space, as was so nicely put this morning. Um, Alexandra, I think it would, it's often for us, with all these frameworks at the EU level, impacts and acts and uh, directives and regulations, I think it's often uh, important for us to understand what really changes in Germany or what changes at German borders with um, this new piece, those new pieces of uh, legislation. So, if you could give a bit of a, uh, give us a, some deed, some some examples maybe, or some some details about what is going to change when the EU AI Act will enter into force in 2026, I believe. Well, that, that's a difficult question uh, because it's not applicable yet and therefore um, it's, it's very difficult to, to see that impact. I think the important thing is it is the first comprehensive legislative framework on AI globally. And that usually inspires other jurisdictions who might follow suit or who might adapt some of the principles. So to say what the impact is on, on German borders, I don't know right now. I think it's mostly the European borders that will be strongly impacted. But I think it risks giving a bad example to other jurisdictions to do exactly the same thing. Um, the other interesting question is within Germany is um, with, will the new parliament, the new commission, will not give enough resources to enforcement, especially of the bans that we have or um, the risk management systems for the systems that we consider risky even in Europe, that will need a huge follow-up in terms of enforcement. And AI is opaque and transparent. It's not easy to follow up. It's very difficult for the people who are impacted by it to understand what is going on and to defend themselves in legal terms. Also because AI impacts people who can't really defend themselves easily. You don't have the money. You don't have the knowledge totally disproportionately. And AI for migrants is really a case in point there. 
Um, so I, I'm more concerned about the message that that part of the AI Act is sending out, and especially what Lena mentioned in, in her last intervention, this kind of possibility to externalize those technologies that will be banned in Europe to other countries, and that could also be Tunisia or Libya or, or the Lebanon. I think this is, this is what I would be particularly concerned about. Thank you. I, I guess we are already kind of getting into the midst of the discussion on what these elections and what the new um, commission, the new set out of the parliament will mean to our specific um, a thematic area that we're looking upon today. So we have elections that um, result in a comfortable majority for, let's say, anti-migration parties. In fact, security and migration and the supposed link between security and migration were one of the two most important, uh, were one of the, um, were some of the most important mobilizers of this election. We've already heard that as well. So um, maybe, Katarina, you could tell us what you think, how will these elections impact digital rights and human rights, and especially for migrant and refugee communities in Europe and also on their way to Europe? I think that um, we are going to be paying the consequences of not having been consistent, um, of not having pushed for a genuine um, just society and having allowed for um, balances uh, to happen. Um, I think what will happen with the far right being like more in power is that um it's so many things now or it's it's so you don't even have to hide to to make them like to be policies and to tell them like racism is not a, a hidden subject anymore but then what it's going to happen is that when we advocate against surveillance which is against a specific group for, of people is because this specific group of people deserve to be treated in dignity and to be protected. And here we are talking about migrant people, racialized people. But it's because when you build a system of surveillance, then we are all at risk. And we have allowed for the building of, building of a biometric uh, system of surveillance that will uh, come for activists, will come for journalists, will come for politicians. And we see this already of how some of the systems that were were put in use for the surveillance of migrant people are now being used against people that protest for the genocide happening in Palestine. Uh, there are people, students in Greece, that have been uh, put into a detention center for migrant people. They are Erasmus students, some of them Italian and also Germans, uh, that have been put into detention because of their protest. Um, so what I think will change is that... Um, we will see how the fact that the selectivity of human rights has been allowed for such a long time will now create such a fragile society and make abuse way easier and harder to fight back. Um, so I know that this is quite grim, but this is the reality, uh, unfortunately, that we have to face. We have to face our responsibility as um, civil society, as politicians, as um, scholars, um, and have the courage in the next months to actually push for a vision for a just Europe, which is consistent and for all. Um, so yes, this would be, this would be my, and then in terms of like what we will see in terms of digital rights in the EU policy making, it will probably be more, you know, just like more laws to make, to break encryption. Uh, someone before in the audience mentioned the, Uh, chat control uh, law, um, it would be more that exchange. I suspect there will be more proposals about anti-smuggling. Um, we already see with the facilitation package that there is a narrative change into how you de-responsibilize European governments uh, and you give the responsibility of death and violence at the border to so-called human traffickers. Um, so we will see a lot of that, uh, but when we see that, we really need to embrace our responsibility into having allowed all of that. 
Katharina, thank you. Um, Alexandra, maybe you want to add to that from the perspective of the European Parliament, I guess, yeah, also within your group there has been, there are lots of discussions going on and uh, we'd like to hear what, what, what is it that you are expecting from this new Parliament? Well, it's still, um, we still don't know what the majority supporting the commission will be. And um, it is certainly going a little bit to the right because the conservatives had a, had a high score. So EPP as well, um, CDU uh, for, the, for the German listeners. Um, but what is really going to make a difference is whether far-right parties like Fratelli d'Italia, Giorgio Meloni, for example, will be part of that majority, that informal majority or not. Um, or whether it's rather being the whole social democratic group and the Greens supporting the new commission president. So if we manage to have a more centrist force, I think we will be able to control it a little bit more. If the far right makes its entry really in the European majority, also in the European Parliament and not only in council, I'm extremely, extremely worried, not only for rights of migrants, but also for our own and for really a loss of rule of law within Europe as well. And that will concern all of us. So that's extremely worrying. To be a little bit more, more technical, I think we had... Um, with the, the Digital Markets Act, the Digital Services Act, and the Artificial Intelligence Act, with all its flaws in terms of migration and asylum, totally, but rather good regulations that could be extremely helpful, but now it's about enforcing them, and these are really, really huge areas, especially DSA and DMA, um, and I don't see the far right being very interested in enforcing that legislations, because what you could do with the Digital Services Act is, for example, chain, uh, changing the algorithms that make sure that all the fear-based messages get that enormous reach and reach out to so many people, which in terms creates this kind of narrative that migration is a threat and that people are frightened and they vote for the far right and the conservatives. So I think the first, I think this, I, I know this goes very far back, but the first thing to do would be the profiling technique to change the profiling techniques used to target, for example, anxious people or people who are already open for that kind of, of messages that are very much fear-based and racist. And the second one, to change the algorithms that make sure all the fear-based messages get so much more reach than every kind of positive approach towards migration telling people, you know, how they're good for our social systems, how they're good for our labor market, um, how human rights are important. You don't get really reach on, in the internet. So changing those algorithms would be important. We have a legal basis with the Digital Services Act to do that somehow, but we need the resources to enforce them. And we're a little bit afraid that the far right and the conservatives will be um, reluctant to do that. Among other things, the former head of public affairs of Meta has been elected as a member of parliament uh, for the EPP. It's not really good news for the enforcement of that legislation either. Um, also, all kinds of other um, mechanisms that you have in the internet, like, like chatbots and bot systems, often paid by Russian agents, uh, paid for and organized by Russian actors who just want to spread that fear because they're very interested in increasing migration and especially this narrative as migration as a threat to security of the European population. So you have these huge um, bot systems. This is also something we could do something against, but we really need the power to enforce that. And that means money, resources for enforcement. And this is something we will need to fight for. And it might be problematic um, if the far right is part of the majority. Um, more in general, I think they will be very um, interested in, in further experimenting with all kinds of um, concerning preoccupying technology uh, for immigration and border control, everything that we have mentioned. I think they want to really use that. And um, there's already the facilitators package that I think Katarina just mentioned. I think that is something that's sort of the anti-smuggling directive because we are hearing all this narrative saying, well, it's all the smugglers' fault. 
who bring people over and it's their fault if people drown. So if we stop the smugglers, people will somehow miraculously uh, stay in their countries uh, with war, with, with extreme poverty, which we all know is not true. But um, I think we see that coming and they are... Um, we see that member states might be required to ensure that a lot of special tools like interception of communication, covered electronic surveillance, etc., uh, will be used to, to investigate and prosecute those offenses. So this is, again, extending those kinds, kinds of technology. And especially, I think, reinforcing continuously this kind of narrative as my, dehumanizing migrants in parliament speeches and setting that kind of tone as, as migration as a pure threat to security that is going to be very worrying and it will impact all the legislation. But really watch the next weeks, watch what's going to happen when we elect a commission president. It really makes a difference if we give power in the parliament to the far right or if we don't and we will fight to avoid that definitely thank you alexandra You're already coming to to um a closer to our strategies um what we can do in the face um in the midst of all of this but at first i would like to hear from lena how um you at amnesty international uh, are what, what you're expecting from the outcome of these elections yeah so Obviously, the, the outcome of this election, especially here in Germany, well, weighs heavily on us as human rights activists and was disappointing. Um, on the bright side, because it's such a grim panel, this um, predicted far-right uh, landslide did not materialize in all European countries. There were even some setbacks on some countries, such as Sweden. And I'm looking forward, it's on my to-do list, to talk to Amnesty colleagues in these countries to um, hear, was there something that helped to change the narrative? Is there something we can adopt or maybe not? Maybe it's something specific that we cannot adopt it, but maybe. So as a community of Europeans, we can also learn from other countries. Um, and it was especially countries such as Germany and France that were that are kind of responsible for more anti-migrant, anti-feminist, anti-human rights um, politicians in the European Parliament now. Um, Alexandra mentioned that it's now the next step for the AI Act, the implementation, and there's one interesting thing about the Act. Um, there's there's some discretion for for member states when it comes to this facial facial recognition technologies. So it's possible for member states to close some of the loopholes. So there's it's called a ban, but it's not a ban because there are so many loopholes on the so-called ban on facial recognition in the AI Act, but it's possible for member states to be stronger. And I hope that uh, this is something we are fighting for in Germany, and I know that many civil society colleagues are trying the same in other European states, so there's still a more hopeful outlook. And especially if you think about the rise of anti-human rights political agendas, I think it's very important even more so to think about how technologies might be used in the future by people with an anti-human rights agenda. So if we talk about facial recognition technology, for example, this is something we can see in many countries already. And I hope that um, German politicians will close these loopholes and implement a full ban on facial recognition for public surveillance here in Germany. Thank you. So this is already something that we can we can work on that doesn't leave us kind of like uh, um, without any um, without any options to act. So I, I'd like to do a last round on the panel and then open the floor for your questions. So um, we are we've started 15 minutes late. So if you're already waiting for lunch, it will we will start at uh, 1:30 p.m. I'm sorry, but um, yes. So our last round. Um, will be on strategies of resistance that um, that we as civil society can um, uh, can follow, that uh, also progressives in politics, in the parliament um, are, lo are looking at, but also strategies of resistance that people on the move are re relying on in the face of these challenges that we've outlined now. Um, maybe who wants to start? Good. Maybe we have Katarina start. It's already strategy of resistance. Um, I could like speak a bit to the work we are doing as uh, Protect Not Surveil, which has been mentioned quite a few times. I'm I'm really glad for it. Um, it's a um, this coalition um, 
which is now led by Access Now, Equinox Initiative for Racial Justice, the European Digital Rights Initiative, EDRI, and the Platform for International Cooperation on Undocumented Migrants, PICO, but then many other colleagues, partners, and friends are, are part of, of the, the effort. Um, and strategy of resistance, we we thought that um, we will need to keep like engaging in like with the EU policies for sure, but in a bold, unapologetic way. I think in a bit what happened with the AI Act, people that started following the negotiation, the actual the proposal from the beginning, there was a big of resistance to add the prohibitions that now are in the in the law. They are clearly uh, insufficient and unfair, but the concept of banning was considered as a radical stance, but it was then made into a totally doable um, legal position. So I think for a civil society, a uh, technique of resistance is to be consistent with what your asks are from the very beginning and do not concede. And then engage, we will, our plan is to engage way more with migrant-led and racialized groups um, because civil society often, especially white, let civil society tend to um, have a paternalistic approach towards these groups that actually hold a positive vision of alternatives uh, and has propositive demands. So I think as a tactic of resistance is also get to these spaces with propositive demands of what we actually want to see, because we usually spend so much time in pushing back and say, reject, reject, but civil society often does not come with what we actually want. And I think we should make an effort into uh, listening to those who have worked on alternative visions already. And this always, always uh, very often comes from um, marginalized groups that have a clear way of how things should change. So those are our two cents. Thank you, Katarina. Positive visions and being brave in what we ask for. I think that's a very, very good um, advice for us. Alexandra, do you want to go next? Well, I can only support for what, what Katarina said, and I, I can emphasize how important the work of, of civil society is for us as politicians, because we often don't have the time to do that, that work, to speak to the communities directly. Um, so to have it already prepared, to have everything documented and to have clear requests of not only what we don't want, but what we do want, um, for us, it is extremely helpful. And I think it has been totally influential in the AI Act. And I think that was a very positive example, um, because in the beginning, when we discussed artificial intelligence, there was very, very little civil society involved. I mean, the way I thought um, the high, uh, what was called high ranking panel expert group, but always in small numbers um, as compared to, to the big companies producing AI, representing their own interests. But I think in the process, their, their influence has really increased and the number of politicians listening them to them and also the impact on the media. And that has been totally influential and extremely, extremely important. So from my, from my side, a big thank you. And um, Tanya, we, we are listening. And we are doing our job to bring this into the parliaments, to bring it back to the media, to work on public opinion. But it's something that we really do, do hand in hand. And I think we have seen a lot of impact, um, for example, in the media with Algo with the Watch, uh, in Germany, ZDF Magazine Royal, who have cooperated. And, and there it was really, it went out to millions and millions of people. And it has really changed the way people look at AI, because at the beginning, it was really only experts with these really small circles, and then it totally opened up, and there was so much more interest, especially in technology. Um, it it's seemed in the beginning very difficult to get civil society interested, and our access now is doing amazing work. Amnesty has an amazing tech, tech team, of really high level, and that really does make the difference. Um, I think it's important also to tell the stories, you know, not only to have the facts, those are important, and the numbers and what is going on, but to tell stories, this is important for the media to pick it up, negative and positive stories, how technology can be used negatively, but also some, some positive stories. And what I also would like to mention, the battle that part of civil society is um, is conducting in the courts on, on data protection, on surveillance, that is also extremely important so thank you so much for that and we, we are listening and we're grateful 
Thank you. So I hear legal battles, um, media narratives, uh, successful campaigns. I think there's, um, there's a lot that we can take from here. Lena, do you want to add to that? Just a little, because I, I agree with everything they've said. Um, so on, on the narratives, um, there's a former colleague of mine, Thomas Coombs, not the only one doing this kind of stuff. He's doing hopeful communications and try to implement that at Amnesty. I try to, sometimes try to remember it, and then I just um, fall back into the traps of not very hopeful communications. So according to my former colleague Thomas, everything we did today was very wrong because we, we talked about all the, the negativity and um, we also remained in... So what we did, like psychologically speaking, was we we remained in the securitization framework by mentioning all the words attached to it. So what we need to do is also as civil society to more flesh out the positive vision we have instead and make sure that people understand how they can be a part of that. And when it comes to people on the move, for example, um, they are not abstract numbers, so let's not talk about them in abstract numbers, but um, talk about them like your friends tell the individual stories, which Thomas tells me is also psychologically necessary because there's a, something that happens with our compassion when we talk about high numbers. Mm -hmm. So we cannot identify with a high number of people. We can just identify with single people or maybe a family. So that's important when we talk about people on the move. Um, Oxford Handbook on Compassion, and that's a very interesting chapter on that. Um, so that, that's the narrative thing I think is interesting. And then we talked so much about the risks of emerging technologies and what we want to see banned. And I have such a long list of things I want to ban. But it's also interesting to see um, where they empower people on the move and also civil societies. So for example, Sea Watch, they have camera surveillance on their boats. I'm normally not a fan of camera surveillance, but they, they use it to document the pushback, they use it to document when Frontex or the Libyan Coast Guards um, repress the work of uh, civil society ships on the Mediterranean. They also use drones and little airplanes to monitor the Mediterranean, um, the seas, and um, to see if there are pushbacks or to alert if, if people on the move in ships are drowning. There recently have been um, efforts by the Italian authorities to criminalize the civil society move of technologies. So while, while the European Union expands its move of these technologies, when civil society and refugees use it, it's being criminalized. The Border Violence Network has a wonderful, very hard to read study on how the phones of refugees, especially if they try to document human rights violations, are taken away from them. Now I'm not positive <laughs> again. Um, so to see how Technology is also used by refugees and civil society and how we can emphasize that and fight back criminalization. That's, that would be good. Thank you, but I... Yeah, some claps here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I think it's, uh, it's, it's important to remember that surveillance can work both ways and we can maybe not survey, but uh, detect... Um, human rights breaches also with the, the same technologies that others are using. And also thank you, Alexandra, for reminding us that it's so important to open up the debate on AI because often, um, often also to me, and I guess to a lot of people, it feels like this is like some expert knowledge that we can't really engage with. And then in the end, it all comes down to politics and to challenge this, to ethical challenges that we do understand. And I hope that this is something that um, we managed to do today, that you understood a lot of what the, the tech challenges and the ethical challenges of these um, pacts are. But of these legal instruments are, but I would like to give you the opportunity to ask your questions uh, if you haven't understood something or if you want to know more about an aspect. There's also um, time for you to, to add your opinion or something that you want to share with the audience. That would be now for the next 15 minutes. And I see uh, Ines already raising her hand. There's another person here in the middle. Mono, can you pass on the mic? And uh, again, you're very much welcome to ask your question in German. And please say who you are. Um, and there's a third question in the back. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm for the people outside. I'm Ines um, Kappert. I'm the director of the Gunnar Werner Institute. 
And I, I would like to thank you all um, for the panel and your insights. And I, my question goes to um, the possibilities of reframing, and um, which is, I think, always has been uh, a huge and important question, but also now with the possibility of social media, um, it's also linked to the digitalization because how how we can spread or we, there is the technical um, possibilities to to spread a, di a reframed a reframing, and my question is, um, since you the all three of you outlined that the conservatives are also buying in this security securization um, narratives. Do you have any experiences you want to share with us how? how we can talk to the conservatives in order to to humanize their narratives again. Do you see any angles or buzzwords we should introduce more in order to um, invite them in a better way to, to humanize their framings? Thank you. Um, maybe you can already think who wants to take that question. Then we, ha we have two more questions and then... Um, take that and have you answer them. Um, yeah, thank you very much uh, for this discussion. Um, my name is Christina Mecke. I'm from the Institute for Migration Research and Intercultural Studies in Osnabrück. Um, I have a very short question on the point that Lena Rohrbach made before that um, it is okay to export um, technology banned in the EU. Um, what about um, EU-funded uh, in border infrastructure um, in, I don't know, in Africa, maybe uh, on the border between Nigeria and Niger? Um, when, when the EU is funding border infrastructure there and AI-based infrastructure, are there any rules for, for this case? Katarina, Alexandra, if, if you know more about the funding procedures, let me know because I honestly don't. So, um, yeah, I think there are. Um, so, so if, there's, uh, if there's funded research such as the Horizon 2020 project, for example, there, there are some rules that they have to be kind of compatible with the human rights. But when you look at what is being funded, um, it seems that there's a large discretion how this is understood. But I'm unfortunately not an expert on the funding rules, so I would rather look it up later and get back to you. Anyone wants to add from that, from our online participants? Um, yes, I cannot. I'm not also an expert myself, but I, I'd advise you to take a look at the judgment from the European Ombudsman uh, regarding the selling of surveillance technology um, to Libyan authorities. Uh, and not only, it was a case that was filed by Privacy International Access Now, um, State Watch, Border Violence Monitoring Network, and I'm sure I'm forgetting a partner that was key into this uh, complaint, but that's what the case. What they were trying to prove is that there are some you, there is a human rights impact assessment that should be conducted beforehand any um, transfer of surveillance technology that was not conducted and that led to uh, human rights violation. But at the end of the day, these rules, also administrative transparency rules, are not enough to uh, prevent these transfers from from happening. But um, yeah, I'd suggest you to. Um, to look at this uh, case, because uh, it's an interesting one. Thank you. It looks like Alexandra wants to add as well. Yeah, I mean, from the funding perspective, I can add that when we speak about physical infrastructure protecting the European borders like defense, I mean, we had this big fence discussion in the past mandate. It was regularly voted down when they tried it or the far right or the conservatives tried to induce it, introduce it. It's, you know, and on, on the level of the budget committee, which decides on that, it was always voted down and then to try to put an amendment in plenary and change it. And it was voted down. And one time we really voted down the whole budget just to get rid of that fencing amendment. And it was quite, you know, it was quite a big issue in the parliament, but that's physical infrastructure for the European borders. 
I think the case that was brought up by, by Christina um, was if it's border infrastructure between, for example, two African countries who are on the transit routes, if, if I understood that correctly. And there, I think I would refer you to what Katarina said. I'm, I'm not quite sure. I think we probably have some you know, human rights assessment, but about applying them in the future, I do have doubts you know, that we really do that. If there was a, a political assessment that, you know, protecting a border between two African countries would be important to stop the routes, I don't know how much the human rights assessment would be respected. I would like to go back to the first question, because I think that's a super interesting question that I've been asking myself a lot. Um, I have two answers who are not super satisfying, exactly, especially the second one from a point of, you know, human rights and humanizing people, but they're more instrumental. I mean, the first one is the Catholic Church has been quite strong on this, especially those organizations of the Catholic Church who actually work with refugees like Caritas. They have spoken out really loudly on this and they have been in touch. So trying a little bit to to increase their pressure or use that kind of language, you know, sometimes if you just use the language that the Catholic church uses for the same thing, it might be helpful when you speak to, to conservatives. So that's, that's one of, um, um, one, one of my, my tips for that. And the second one, which is more instrumental is we have this huge uh, lack of labor force in Germany and it's totally idiotic that we block people and spend enormous amounts of money at blocking people at the borders rather than letting them in and train them. I know in the human rights community, it's not an argument that people like, but it really works with entrepreneurs and you have them very, very quickly on your side. And then they start telling you stories how they trained refugees. And then when they turn 18, the police comes up and, and sends them back to their countries and, and entrepreneurs are really frustrated about this policy. And in Germany, the conservatives and the liberals and, and also to some extent the social democrats have this, this view that you have refugees who are totally useless, which we don't want, we need to block out. And then we have these highly talented people we need to import from other countries. And it's basically the same people just arriving um, by, by different ways. So I think really going back to the fact that um, that the industry actually needs a lot of young people and that these are young and talented people and we just need to find a way to train them correctly without keeping them two years, you know, without them being able to enter the, the labor market and to learn the language properly and to, to improve our capacity as a society to integrate them into German society, but see them as, as talent and as an opportunity rather than as a threat that could help to change the narrative and the way these people are viewed. And, and there, I think the, the individual stories help a lot. You know, when I was campaigning, um, I, I kept um, meeting this, this AFD guy, so really far right, who had this the standard line that was um, talent or highly skilled people don't come on a dinghy from the Mediterranean. I said, well, yes, I know a family and they came with, with six people, with, with six children. And the first one is now doing his, his PhD in, in, in physics, uh, specializing in medical machines. So he's going to save a lot of life in Germany. And the second daughter is IT and the third one pharmaceutics. And they're all getting university degrees and so on. And, and you tell a story, you know, and this is a physical person who did come on a dinghy over the Mediterranean as a refugee from Syria and is now really giving back to human to German society um, in, an, in an amazing way. And then they say, well, that's just an individual case, but we can make lots of individual cases like that. So these two things, taking over the language of the church, because they're very critical of that approach, the Catholic Church, especially in Germany. And they have a really strong paper against the far right and also on migration and on the migration pact. And this more instrumental argument um, of, of seeing these people as an opportunity and as a talent for our society that, that we really, really need in times of demographic change and not having enough young people to keep up our economy. Katharina is getting ready to add. Um, Yes, please. And then we have uh, Mirka's question and there are two more questions. Yeah, so I'll be short because uh, we are yeah, also short on time. Um, I think this is an interesting question that we should ask. Um, and I also want to, I, I wanted to highlight the fact that I don't think we lack of like 
you know, it's not that people do not know. People know. It's just that they don't care. Like we have seen for years images of people drowning. We are like in the last eight months, we have seen images of like baby being scattered around and like all the death happening in Gaza. So it's not a problem about not knowing of of like like uh, the the violence, uh, but it's like it's about the dehumanization and. While I kind of agree with what Alexandra said, I see this approach also kind of like falling into the trap of uh, the dehumanization because like if we, it's like if people had to prove to be, you know, worthy enough as with the system that is actually trying to uh, oppress them. So I understand uh, the functionality of this approach, but at the same time, it's always maintaining this imbalance of power and someone needs to be prove that they are worthy as the ones that hold the power. But I do understand why this could work uh, in some context. What I think we should always remember is that there is a big percentage of people that do not go to vote, uh, refrain from using their rights, and there is a big percentage of people that do not have the right to vote. So there is a lot of power to be reclaimed with people that usually just are out of the picture. And I think uh, it's it's a lot about rephrasing what safety is in a way that is not challenging what they say, but is claiming what we think safety is. And also going also to showing how surveillance is harming us all and is a profitable business. And there are like the same people that are leaving us without jobs are the same people that are making big, big, big money from all of this industry. But that's a long journey and it cannot be a quick one because it's about building a relationship with people that are uh, traditionally excluded and that are needed to rephrase what safety, safety, collective safety actually is. Thank you, Katarina. I think we can now hear the question from Mirka, but before I'd like to say, because this is a, the context in which we're speaking within Germany, I think it's important that when once we mention what's happening in Gaza and babies killed within Gaza, we also have to mention babies killed being on babies were killed on the other side of the wall so um and also kind of hold true to what we are exp what we're talking about that empathy goes goes every way and human rights are not only the rights of a certain subgroup or other um milka could i first have your question sure. please? thank you all for the panel um i i, I want to return to the EU AI Act and ask about the relationship between the Act and GDPR because there are some tensions between GDPR legislation and the uh, AI Act and I'm wondering whether you see in those tensions any potential opportunities to uh, resist some uh, of the worst aspects of the AI Act because I know GDPR has been used sometimes to um, uh, issue fines to when governments use technology in problematic ways. For example, I know I can think of examples in Greece where this has happened recently. So I'm just wondering whether you see any tensions there and any potential opportunities to fight back against sort of some of the worst excesses of uh, the AI Act or its consequences. And maybe for everyone in the room who doesn't know this uh, acronym, GDPR, DSGVO, and. Uh, <laughs> Maybe if that helps. And don't ask me what it stands for. But the Datenschutzgrundverordnung. Okay. Oh, I have Mirka explain it quickly. Thank you. It's, uh, it's the General Data Protection uh, leg uh, Regulation. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Who, would, who wants to take on that question? Or maybe we have the, the two other questions first and then uh, last round of answers. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lel Mirhan. Thank you very much for this very interesting conference today. Um, it's not actually a question, it's just a comment. Um, I am a migrant and also I teach about racism and migration. And for the question before about uh, how do we talk with right-wing uh, people and groups, of course it's a very legitimate question and it's very important also and at the same time I think it's most or more important in my perspectives, that we question ourselves as leftist people, what is, what is and what are our responsibilities also with the racism that is in society and in Europe. That's the first thing that came to my mind. And also the second, I was a bit um, thinking or waiting for less othering through the discussion and also through the speeches. 
also not to be all the time talking about us as refugees, as migrants, as if we don't exist in the room, maybe really invite politicians and academic and activists who are our migrants, our refugees, that made me a bit feel also a bit excluded and not like also from the whole perspectives actually that it is the point of the whole um, conference. And that's also connected with the point about um, let's uh, tell the right wing people what I've just heard now, for example, that yeah, there are success stories. There is those families who come and still make it to PhD. That's not uh, from very perspectives of so much migrants and refugees. That's the narrative that we are fighting actually against. We are human beings, punct, point. We don't need more. We don't need to prove to anyone we are good. We are not monsters. Yes, we are monsters. We are good. We are bad. We are everything and we are human beings and we have the right to be whatever we want. So I don't await that people talk about us and that we need to prove to anyone who we are and that we have the exist and we have the right to exist and to move and actually movement is the most beautiful thing in life look at us how we move in our thoughts in our bodies in our everything migration is how life started and that's the beauty of life we came to life through migration through bewegung through movement and we don't need to prove <laughs> to anyone that yeah we are good please accept us here thank you very much thank you Yeah, um, my name is Hertzberg Asma. I'm working like, uh, as a legal advisor um, on the field of migration asylum uh, here in Germany since a couple of years. I've been working in this field like for almost 20 years in different countries in the EU. And I was seeing the policy and regulations going more and more aggressive. Um, so basically, I would think that there is a lot of disinformation um, in people, what they get as information. There is no, I think there is not a lot of work done on that field. And policy, politics are reacting to that, so escalating. So we're responding, we're hearing you people. So going through more aggressive uh, way to manage m migrations and um, refugees' flaws coming here, in here. So my question, if there's anything to do on that using digital AI, um, for example, maybe. Um, my second question is about, is there any way to use AI or a digital border control in the EU as uh, a lie? Because seeing or uh, watching what is happening in the border, actually in the EU in some countries like Poland or uh, um, Hungary or Lithuania, if there's a way to use it as a control of um, guaranteeing human rights, human rights of asylum seekers, of uh, the rights of asking for asylum in the EU. So if there is a way to just turn it up as a, a lie and not as a, a monster, because that's something happening. I think we pragmatically, we can't uh, uh, go away from it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, who would like to take on that last question and who would like to take on the question on GDPR? And thank you for your intervention as well. I think there was no question in, in, the, in the middle context. Any volunteers? I'll give you, I can give you, uh, Lena, Lena is getting ready. So. I, I can start. Um, so um, regarding AI as an ally, so I have more, as I think as civil society and as um, affected persons, we have more, we have already some experience of using technology as an ally. I gave examples from like documenting with cameras, for example, also when it comes to police violence or something like that and less with AI because it's um, unfortunately technology um, which is, uh, so you, you need a lot of resources to program it. You need a lot of training data, which often comes from highly dubious sources and so on. So it's not that easy to use for small civil society organizations at the moment. Um, I know that um, AI is being used, for example, from people that um, use it to search in the Syrian archives. Because there are, so, there are so many documents and so many interviews with torture survivors and AI can help um, so that you don't have to read all the documents every time. So, 
Um, when it comes to border, uh, the documentation of border violence, I'm sure that um, great people on the move and from civil society will find solutions, although I, I don't know of any examples yet. And the GDPR, I think that's really interesting to look deeper into that and, and how far you can you use that friction between AI and GDPR. For example, uh, something that people can do is to ask um, AI developing companies whether they have data on you. That's something you can do under the AI. People have done it with Meta, for example, asked for all the data they have on you. And this can also be uh, used to make... Um, large AI companies more transparent and see where they are using our data. Because if your data is somewhere, if your photo is somewhere on the internet, it's very likely it's being used to train some large LLM model. No, no not LLM, but some large AI model somewhere by a big monopolizing company. Um, also the option for to issue fines and just protect your personal data. Um, on the second question, I, um, that was you. Thank you very much for your feedback, and um, I'm, I'd be uh, thankful if we can talk more about that and uh, take in mind to be very nuanced with my own wording of us, because sometimes I think it's not clear what I mean by us. Sometimes I mean us at Amnesty International, but sometimes I mean us at civil society, which are both more diverse groups. Sometimes I'm trying to own my responsibilities as a white person and say us as white persons, but it's, it's, it's different every time. And sometimes maybe it's not completely clear to either the audience or myself, where I'm positioning myself at the moment. So thank you very much for that feedback. And I agree on what you said. Thank you very much. I think there's not much that I could uh, add to that. Um, we are five past half, uh, so, so 135. Um, I'm not sure you can say that in English, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, but anyways, it's lunchtime. Um, I want to thank you all for, your, um, for the time um, that you spent with us, share, for sharing your expertise, for um, the very important thoughts, also for your feedback. Thank you so much for that. Um, also for the feedback on the, on the positive narratives from all of you. I think that's something that we can keep in mind for the afternoon. And I can um, assure you that a lot of the questions that have been raised will be raised again, maybe answered in the afternoon. I hope you stay tuned. See you later. See you in one hour. <laughs>